John's Islamic Context Introduction Robert Holler notes that John of Damascus was particularly important as a source for Byzantine and Western Christian views of Muhammad being the first to, to speak of Muhammad's revelation and legislation, portrayal of Christ, carnal vision of paradise, his many wives and his instruction by a monk. In reality, John not only gives us information about Muhammad, but he also provides an important window into the early developments of Islamic, the Quran, and the narrative of 8th century theological disputes. The traditional view, drawing on Muslim sources, provides many details of the life and teachings of Muhammad and recounts thousands of Muhammad's sayings collected in what is known as the Hadith. This view also holds that the Quran was canonized in Prophet Arabic within 20 years of the Prophet's death and related detailed accounts of battles and lists of the people involved. Yet, none of these things can be validated to the 7th century when the alleged oracle because they were not written down until most 150-200 years later. The traditional view concerning Muhammad, Islam, and the Quran is accepted by most Muslims and also by a number of Western scholars, just such as, just as, just as John Esposito and Karen Armstrong. Many other Western scholars, however, point to the paucity of sources of the traditional view and raise more questions of that answer. Some, like Arthur Jesse, conclude that after reviewing the traditional account of the development of Quran, very little examination is needed to reveal the fact that this account is largely fixed to use. Nothing is more certain than, the, than that when the Prophet died, there was not collect, no collected, arranged, collected body of revelations. This regular absence of documentary evidence, not only in relation to the Quran but also in regard to the, li to the li life and teaching of Muhammad and the early religious beliefs of his followers, has created a number of possible scenarios for where there is a lack of evidence, there is an abundance of speculation. One scholar, Fred, Fred Donald, describes a four categories on approaches that researchers have come up with in order to interpret the evidence that is available. Donald's four categories concerning the development of Islam. Donald's four categories concerning the development of Islam are the descriptive approach, the source critical approach, the traditional critical approach, and the skeptical approach. The descriptive approach essentially accepts that, accepts the traditional picture of Islamic origins presented by the Muslim sources. This approach was founded upon three, three main assumptions of, uh, above about the sources. First, that the Quran contained factual information, factual information about Muhammad and his teachings. Second, that the Muslim chronicles written a most 150 to 200 years after the death of Muhammad was reliable for reconstructing an accurate picture of what really happened, and third, that the hadith was separate from the historical accounts of the chronicles and could be, be, treat, and could be treated as a distinct re religious literature helpful for developing religious pity rather than determining historical reliability. reliability. Turner comments that writing from this view is appealing and often applauded by the Muslims, but the reliability of the narratives unravels under the scrutiny of historical and philological analysis. Donner concludes that numerous instances of glaring contradictions among different sources are of logical and chronicle absurdity, implausibility, or potent sectarian or political bias. Marginalist this, marginalist this approach as other than historically unacceptable. It is also interesting to note that John of Damascus, writing over 100 years after Muhammad's death, make, makes no mention of hadith material in his writings on Islam, 
nor does he seems he seem to be aware of, of any chronicle factors though he is con cognizant of some of the writings of Muhammad and some of the claims that of the Ismailites. The source critical approach began in the mid 19th century by Julius Wellhausen and others attempted to use source criticism as it had been applied to the Bible in order to resolve pattern contradictions and logical solidities in the sources. Donner outlines both assumptions for this view. First, it was assumed that much of the early historical material could be considered reliable, but it was intermixed with unreliable material that had been corrupted by inaccurate and out inaccurate oral transmission, trivial biases, and polemics. A second assumption was that non-Muslim sources, especially in Syria and Greek, could provide corroboration of the reliability of evidence mentioned in the Arabic narratives. The third assumption was that the Hadith material was essentially non-historical and therefore unreliable for any accurate reconstruction of Islam history. Finally, the fourth assumption was that the Quranic text itself has been accepted without any firm documentary evidence. The next of our assessment of the source critical approach is that it provides good insight and guidelines, guidelines for the interpretation of the Quran and other written sources in regard to Muslim beliefs as well as politics and it, and it allowed for a more accurate arrangement of materials of material so that interdependencies and relationships could be ascertained. The main limitation, however, is that while scholars could gain a better understanding of Muslim or how Muslims in the third century AH viewed, viewed the first century origins, they would not be able to verify those views since there were no Muslim documents from that period. In other words, this approach works well for written documents but fail to promote historical and philological confidence in, uh, in the absence of first century written sources. When we compare this view with the unwriting of John of Damascus on Islam, who did write, the, who did write at the end of the Islamic first century, we are reminded that he also considered the writings of Muhammad to contain absurdities and the message to be motivated by a polemic agenda. In addition, he wrote that some of the practices were based on pagan rituals and erroneous theological interpretations. The traditional critical approach inaugurated by Ignaz Gotzi-Herz's study on the Hadith in, 1870, uh, in 1890 accepted the idea that the second literature of Muslims, the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sirah contain a kernel of historical effect. But they argued that much of the tradition evolved over time and so the impact of political, theological, social, and other issues that were important not at the time of the event of their accounts are supposed to be describing, e.g., the life of the Prophet, but only at the same time during the long period when the tradition was being transmitted first orally and later in increasingly rigid written form. In doing his research, Gossier discovered that many of the hadiths that he was using to reconstruct early events in the life of Muhammad were actually forgeries. In time, he questioned the, he questioned the whole corpus of hadith as well as the nuts Wastrates the transmission of the hadiths and gave them authority. This also led to to other questions about the way of the way that Muslim scholars evaluated their own traditions and interpretations. Ultimately, Donner points out those in the tradition critical approach rejected the documentary hypothesis of the strictly source critical approach and claimed that while many of the early accounts of all the Muslims may be spurious from a historical point of view, there is a still a reasonable belief that with, with careful analysis and comparison of sources, 
that the original account may be determined, or at least the earliest extent version can be recovered. One of the obvious difficulties will maintain with maintaining this position is that there are no Islamic documentary sources that recorded er the, these early events. At best, there are there are oral accounts that were written down perhaps starting in the middle of the 8th century, but the bulk of them are from the 9th century. Written without written documentation, how can these events be verified? This is why the works of John of Damascus on Islam are so important for us today. As a default Christian, John lived in the midst of the Islamic stronghold and witnessed the events as they unfolded. If anyone can verify the state of Islam in the early 8th century, it is certainly John of Damascus. This lack of written, of written documentation of the, on the part of the Muslims is the basis of the argument that, for, that of what a group that Donald does with those who hold to the skeptical or revisionist approach. While the scholars may accept the notion of the tradition critics that the origins of Islam and the result of an evolution of oral traditions, they reject the idea that any kind of historical information has remained intact so that the real story of Islam could be reconstructed. After all, they would say if the hadith with their isnats were forgeries, then why would the so called historical accounts not make the same conclusion since they can be they can also be sound to follow a similar isnatic transmission? Also the written documentation documents to give evidence to this essays in the first place that for almost 200 years after Muhammad's death. Donner states that there are generally three assumptions put, put forth by the skeptics. First, the Quran was derived from a number of sources external to Islam perhaps even including Syriac Christian liturgy and Jewish commentary, and the Quran itself was not canonized until late in the 2nd century H.A. A.H. Therefore, it cannot be used to give an accurate picture of the organ of the religious of Islam or the role of Muhammad. Second, the narratives of Islamic origins should be understood from a bias of salvation history. In other words, in other words, it is not possible at this time to retrieve the kernel of historical information because whatever facts survive would be in inextricably inextricably woven into the fabric of later polemical interpretation. Third, the narratives concerning the life of Muhammad are derived from the Sirat literature that try to explain the Quran through exegetical extrapolations and second century interpretations. Therefore, they cannot be used to determine history events that took place in the first century of Islam or provide a basis for the legal tradition developed from the Hadith because the connection to Muhammad may only be illusory by uncertain and certainly not adduced from any historical documents. In other words, the revisionists are saying that the Hadith were derived from early commentaries on the Quran beginning sometime in the later half of the 8th century as believers tried to make sense of various pages, passages in the Quran and then the material was used to write the history of the Prophet's life and to explain the Quranic text in the second in the second layer of executive activity. Regarding this historical historiographical approach by early Muslims, which draws one body of literature, the hadith, the hadith from another, the Quran, in order to reject a third the life of Muhammad, Patricia Kun claims that much of the material is merely comprised of residues of religious arguments and in the end the bulk of its the bulk of it is the piece of an obliterated past. 
even though it gives credit to the skeptics when she states that the skeptical approach derives plausibility from years of source critical and tradition critical research that have conclusively demonstrated the existence of Islamic tradition of a heavy overlay of abuse, legend, and the influence of manipulations, distortions, and fabrications of all kinds. In the end, the skeptic take the skeptics take it a step further and argue that the kernel of historical truth may never be recoverable since it, it since since it spits on only successive layers of repeatedly received and rejected material. Donner, however, is not willing to go this far and is critical of Islamic sources and, unco and concludes that the revisionist view does not adequately assess to the complex historical developments and societal paradigm so shifts that took place in the first 100 years of Islam. However, when we examine the writings of John of Damascus, we notice a number of correlative areas shaped, shared with the revisionists. First of all, First of all, John's recognition of some writings of Muhammad with different titles reveals his familiarity with some parts of the Quranic text and his inference that they comprise different, different writings rather than one book mitigates against the fully canonized Quran by the mid 8th century, which corresponds with what the revisionists purport. Secondly, much like the revisionists, his trans defense of the Trinity and the deity of Christ against the clear doctrinal attack, attacks of Quranic statements attests to his recognition of the nature of polemical interpretation on the part of the Muslims. Lastly, John limit, John's limited knowledge of Muhammad may infer that biographical information was as scarce even in the mid 8th century, perhaps revealing the lack of Sirat literature in the, hari, in the Hadiths. However, this may support the revisionist view that much of a life of Muhammad was redacted from the Quran, which in turn was used to develop the Hadiths. An alternative view of the development of Islam. While Donner's revisionist, while Donner's revisionist view seems to correspond best with the mid 8th century writings of John of Damascus, there are still historical and theological perspectives that do not that do not match up, match up. Perhaps this is because one of the main problems with Donner's four views is that they are basically 19th and 20th century interpretations of egg and ninth century reconstructions. Is there a more scientific history that will interpret it and reconstruct the events according to the dat to data that corresponds to the 7th and early 8th centuries such as archaeological, epigraphic and numismatic evidence? Gary Habermas of the one of, of the World's authorities on the historicity of the resurrection of Christ posits that if history is the occurrence of past events as well as the recording and interpreting of them, and if we want to obtain the most objective data possible, then we need to ascertain as nearly as possible those facts that best fit in the data. In regard to an early Islam, we should choose our interpretation according to that which best fits the evidence than that which provides the more probable conclusion. In other words, when dealing with the evidence, whether it is documentary, archaeological, epigraphic or numismatic material of eyewitness reports, the results should the results should conform to all known data and provide the most comprehensive and probable judgment on the issues. It should also be defensible based on the, the on the most factual data available. In this way, historical investigation takes on the role of a scientific study of the events and history and historians are able to use their evidence based tools in a fashion much like forensic scientists who seek to reconcile past even based on their best data and most probable conclusions. The British historian G. R. Elton seems to agree with this view and as that historical events are independent and have a real existence outside of the interpretations of modern observers and therefore when the evidence of the events increases, 
the likelihood of one starting a more visible understanding of the event are also increases. Thus, history can be scientifically studied, he says, and with more accurate evidence, the historian will be able to provide a more probable explanation of the events. This is very much what the revisionist attempt, attempted in the 1970s and 1980s. Donner may have pointed out the weakness of the lack of documents to promote the revisionist views, but the use of the of other evidence have ever revolutionist recent Islam stu Islamic studies. In addition to the revisionists, we now have a host of scholars whom I call the neo revisionists who have corrected some of the shortcomings with the revisionists and bring to bear a much more scientifically accurate interpretation of the first two centuries of Islamic of Islam based on a higher based of a higher level of investigative research using a type of historical forensics. In the end, their view may not be the most plausible one for a reconstruction of the history of early, of, of early Islam, but it is certainly interesting and revolutionary and deserves to be held up against the testimony of the 7th century non-Muslim accounts as well as the 8th century testimony of John of Damascus. <laughs> The neo revisionist view. From the neo revisionist school, we get a very different picture on the daily development of Muhammad, the Quran, and the religion of Islam. Jeremy Jones of Oxford University believes that one of the reasons of this difference is due to the problematic character of the Islamic, of the Islamic literary source, sources. John writes. If our goal to comprehend the way in which, is, in which Muslims of the late 2nd, 8th and the 3rd, 9th centuries understood the origin of their society, then we are very well of in there, then we are very well off indeed. But if I am to find out what really happened, i.e. to develop reliability document answers to modern to modern questions about the early earliest decades of Islamic study societies, then we are in trouble. The problem of course is that there is an almost total lack of any contemporary sources from the Islamic side until the late, until late, of, until late in the 8th century, almost 150 years after the death of Muhammad. The earliest written account dealing with the life of Muhammad, for example, is the biography by Ibn Ishaq, supposedly written before 767 but only appearing as a recension in Ibn Isham's biography, biography written in the early 9th century. The diversity of material evidence from, early, from earliest decades of Islam makes it extremely difficult to assign anything about Islamic origins from Muslim sources. Thus, Outside of some archaeological and epigraphic information, knowledge about the Prophet Muhammad, the first four caliphs, and, and the development of, of the Quran is undocumented according to the uh, according to modern historical research methods. John points out that there is a crystallization of a fluid oral tradition represented by the copies written Arabic narratives of the late 8th century, but they could not be considered to be what he calls scientific theory unless they can be corroborated by earlier external non Muslim evidence. As an archaeologist, Nifu suggests that there are three things that tell a better story that written accounts since they avoid inher the inherent bias of the writer, rock, inscriptions, archaeological sites, and coins. Even then, the archaeological, epigraphical, and numismatic evidence left by the Arabs differs greatly from the great traditional account, which Nifu advises needs to be radically reinterpreted or discarded altogether as historical fact. Like Jeremy Jones, Nifu cautions that non-contemporary 
literary sources are in our opinion in our opinion inadmissible as historical evidence it if one has no sources of if one has no source of knowledge of the 7th century except texts written in the 9th century of la or later one cannot know anything about 7th century one can only know what people in the 8th, 9th century or later believe about 10th century. Literature that may convey history. This is perhaps why Patricia Cohn believes that the best thing to do is to step outside the Islamic tradition altogether and start again. For if it was the storytellers who created the tradition in the first place, then how will we know which stories to accept and which ones to discard? Robert Holland agrees and further suggests that a study of non-Muslim evidence pertaining to the 7th century may be able to give us the insight needed to piece together the puzzle of early Islam. Holland agrees that these non-Muslim literary sources from the first 100 years of Islam corroborated by archaeological, epigraphic, and numismatic evidence may tell us more that, than skeptical allows for, allow for. Hoyland recounts, for example, the early Christian writers from the late 7th and early 8th centuries indicate that Muhammad, at least, or at least the one who was recognized as the, as the leader of the Arabs, who was known previously as a military leader, a trader, king, monotheist, a revivalist, a lawgiver, and a, and a prophet. These are very specific terms that are given for a specific person fulfilling these roles. We must proceed with caution, however, for while these testimonies give evidence for an, for an historical person, the accounts are often biased by, biased by religious influences and some of the documents that recount these eyewitness reports are later copies that may have been altered due to political or religious motives. With this occasion in mind, these few non-Muslim writers from the 7th century do seem to give evidence of cult like religious Patricius or a, a con and a controversial leader. In, a, in addition, it is evident from these sources that the invading Mu'minun or believers did in fact have a monotheistic fact fit with distinctive values in opposition to the belief to the, of the Christians. They were iconoclastic and they prayed toward the Kaaba, which they considered to which they considered the house of God. They also sacrifices they also sacrificed before the Kaaba, worshipped the sacred stone and conducted the worship in specific places called Masjid. A few like Sebio circa six hundred sixty refer to Muhammad as a guide and a structure who asked his followers to obey to obey the law that was revealed to him by God. Sebius also God then Muhammad legislated that they were they were not to eat carrion, not to drink wine, not to speak falsehoods, not and not to commit adultery. This is similar to John's list of Saracen customs and practices at the end of heresy of the Ismailites, when he mentions the practice of circumcision of men and women, orders not to observe the Sabbath, orders to not to baptize orders not to eat certain forbidden food, and orders not to drink any wine. Furthermore, the sources recognize that although the Arab Muhajirun held Jerusalem in honor, they were hostile to the, to the cross and denied that Christ was the Son of God. Thus, even though we do not have seven century accounts of Muhammad from Muslim writers, we do have indications from non-Muslims that Muhammad not only existed, but was responsible for ushering in a, in a new belief system with laws, practices, and beliefs that not only motivated by the motivated the Arab invaders, but also unified them under a new vision. Writing almost write, writing almost 80, 80 years later, 
John of Damascus, also considered Muhammad to be an historical figure, but he caused Muhammad a false, false prophet, and he called the religion of his followers a heresy. He also ridiculed the so-called writings that came down to Muhammad from heaven. Did John receive, did John receive his information of the seven century non-Muslim accounts? Why he, was he provided to documentary sources? That no longer that no longer exist, both Muslim and Christian, or was he subject to the same influences as those around him, tracing the development of Muhammad as well as possible sources for the Quran and other early Islamic writings may help us better understand the eighth century context from from which John of Damascus wrote his critics on Islam. In addition, the earlier written accounts by non-Muslim eyewitnesses may be able to provide more of the background that is necessary in order to best understand John's context. It is to these accounts that we now turn our attention. Testimony of the non-Muslim sources. When the Arabs began conquering the cities of the Middle East, non-Muslim eyewitnesses believed that their attackers were a punishment from God for their own spiritual rebellion or for sins committed by other rival Christian groups. Walter Kegi examines a number of these eyewitness accounts. He writes that Sophronius believes believed the Arab invasion was divine punishment for Christian sin because of the because of countless sins and very serious faults. 139. Anastasius perceived the Arab's conquest was a divine retribution for Christian sins. Also, especially the fault of Emperor Constance for his persecution of the Orthodox Church 143, Sebios blamed Christians themselves, for we have merited, for we have sinned against the Lord. Pseudo Methodius was another who believed it was because the was because of the lawlessness of the Christians and John of Nicu, who was monophysite said that it was due to divine anger against the errors of the Chalcedonian, Christi Chalcedonian Christians. 148. A number of the eyewitnesses testifies not only to the brutality of the infering forces, but also to the godless nature. Others, however, testified that while some in the marauding forces were pagan, Others seem to expose a type of monotheism that incorporated divine Jewish overtones mixed with an amalgamation of Arab, study, of Arab traditions and anti-Christian beliefs. Most of the Byzantine inhabitants seem to expect that their fathers would be beaten back by a reinforcement of the Byzantine army, but after that hope faded a, faded a bewilderment set in as set in as they determined to make the best of the situation. The invading forces called themselves Muhajirun emigrant or Mu'minun the believers. Yet exactly what they what they believe in was not readily apparent. Most of the Syrian Christians knew the Arab conquerors as Saracens, Hagarinis of or Ismailites of all which has really all of which have religious associations. Even one hundred years after John of Damascus father has surrendered the city of Damascus to the enemy forces, John was still referring to the Arabs with these same terms, though he only used the appellations given by the Christians. Through the title of John's treatise the heresy of the Ismailites, we can ascertain that John accepted the religious nature of the Arabs, but he also still considered their beliefs to be an aberration from true Christianity. In fact, John went so far as to call Muhammad a false prophet and the religion of the Ismailites the religion of the Antichrist. 
He even blamed Kung Hamas false theological views of his encounter with an Aryan monk. Like John, early witnesses provide a window into the development of the heresy of the Ismailites, of the Ismailites as well as examples of the responses of the various Christian groups displaced by the conquest. These non-Muslim voices are very significant, not only in that they not only in that they gives uh, they give us a literary connection back to the beginning of the conquest in the 630s, but also because they provide an outsider's critical view of the ev of the events of the and developments in the religion that has become Islam. This success may not be an abandoned as the Muslim as the Muslim sources dated from the late eighth century, but they are, they are eyewitnesses uh, eyewitness accounts and as Nevo points out they reflect the period in light of a completely different wavelength and from a different angle. As with any literary sources, however, Nivo wants us that there are problems and shortcomings associated with the text besides the normal dating and authentic authenticity test. The primary shortcoming is that these sources were religious in nature rather than historical. They were composed of sermons, religious moralizing, apocalyptic literature, letters from church officials, and even polemical responses to the perceived heresies of the Arabs. The, the purpose of the documents was not necessarily the recording of historical events, but rather the promotion of a particular religious view. The, thus, even when the sources is apparently factual, reading history from it can be hazardous, since it may be dealing with theological disputes between rival Christian sects, or it may contain biases based on particular theological interpretations. Therefore, Nivo believes that there are several questions that need to be asked of the non-Muslim texts in order to determine the actual historical nature of the events. First, what is the factual content that can be extracted from the source, minus its particular bias? Second, as the events as the events describing these things, describing things that have taken taken place in the past during the time of the writer are still to take place in the future, such as in apocalyptic literature. Third, which theological perspective is being promoted since it will be it will act as filter for the events described. For example, Sophronius Patia of Jerusalem recorded in his Christians in his Christmas sermon of 634 that the reason of the Arabs blocked the Christmas position to Bethlehem that year was due to the many sins and grievous errors committed by the people of God and therefore they will unfit to make their annual pilgrimage to the holy to the holy site. From this sermon, we can ascertain that the Arabs were in control of the area in the year 634 and they had limited their seats to the town of Bethlehem. However, when Sophronius refers to the conqueror as vengeful and God-hating Saracens, who carried a blood-loving blade, he was not only say, saying that they were brought to violence, but he was also strongly indicating that they were not religious. Yet, in 639, Sophronius gives an account of the godless Saracens entering Jerusalem and building a place intended for the best god as Moscow, Mosque, Mitzgita. How godless could they be if they, if they rush in to the if they rush in to establish if they rush in to establish a place of prayer as soon as they had control of the city. This account reveals how the bias of the order can misconstrue the misconstrue factual events due to a religious agenda which a caution we need to shit as we proceed. Or the earliest non-Muslim sources is the anti-Jewish tract Doctrina Jacobinu Per Baptizati, set around the year 634. 
in Mencienstadt. A false prophet has appeared among the Saracens and is proclaiming the faith of the anointed who is come to who is to come. The leader is also supposed to have had the keys the par to paradise and to have come with the sword and the carry out. Nevo does Nevo does not believe that this this describes the Muhammad that we know the in the traditional sense since he does not proclaim that our that the hour is nigh. But rather proclaims the coming of the anointed one and is said to have the keys to paradise something something that is not mentioned in any of these traditional ac accounts. Nevo also believes that the Messiah was probably in the Aramaic and something the people north of Arabia would be familiar with rather than Arabic, which they would not have paid heed to. Ground and Cook believe on the art on the other hand that this could be an earlier reference to an actual historical account of Muhammad which would run contrary to the traditional account since it occurs two years after this after his death in six hundred thirty two. Thus Muhammad in the few would have led the invading Arabs proclaiming the advent of the Messiah and claim to hold the keys of paradise in the end. Nevo cautions us. The prophet that is described will be more out of a Judeo Christian background than an Arab one, and therefore could be just a reference to passing to passing to a passing prophet of the times. Nevo also reminds us that the prophet of the doctrina Jacobi is not named, and it is only by inference that Quran and others adopt the name of Muhammad. Indeed, the prophet could have been the leader of the Saracens at the time, either Abu Bakr or Uthman, or another Ismailite prophet, who was raised up by God to conquer the, Byz the, Byzantine, the Byzantines and restore the land. It could even have a reference to a prophet in the rabbinic apocalyptic tradition. About the same time, Thomas the Presbyter, we are circa 640, writing in Syriac, relates, the, relates how the Arabs invading or con invaded and conquered Syria in 635 until, this, until 636, even killing a number of monks when they storm the monasteries, he is also apparently the first one to mention Muhammad by name. Thomas says that there a battle there, there was a battle between the Romans and the Arab of Muhammad Tayaye de the map in Palestine twelve miles east of Gaza. The the reference of Muhammad, however, may have been inserted in a later copy of this document as was commonplace at the time, but if it originally did refer to Muhammad by name, then would have the commentary evidence of the existence of Muhammad as early as AD 640, the time of the completion of Thomas Conigal. There is also mention of the Arabs of Muhammad on the fly leaf of the 6th century Syria, of a 6th century Syria manuscript of the Gospels scribbled in Arabic. Holland believes that in post-636, a definitive date is impossible to give to the, to the fragmentary network of the page. The phrase we saw, the, pre, the phrase we saw may indicate that it was eyewitnesses account of battle that took place in 636, but even though the caution due to the fragmentary network and that indeterminate date. One of the known dangers in using literary resources to determine actual history is that documents can be changed later on when they are copied by translated into a different language. For example, Nero, Ni Nero argues that a sermon on the Feast of Epiphany 636 or 637 by Sophronius could have been embellished with a long list of Arab atrocities by a later transcriber who knew the traditional account. We have no information on the date that on the date of manuscript or it or its transmission history but suggests that either the entire section was tackled was taken 
on the server just saying one at a later date. Or that his initial rhetoric question. Why do Bergen raise a bond? Why was considerably embellished by later transcriber who knew the traditional account and therefore knew better than Sophronius what the prophecy abomination of dissolution entailed? Words could have been added to the same of change or change by later translators, and in, the, in this way, the traditional account could have been read back into Sophronius' account. Since the earliest copy that we have the, of the sermon is from the 6th century, this can be certainly possible. Another barrier to accurately assessing the literary sources is that modern critics may be reading the traditional account back into the words of these early witnesses. Nivo, Jesus of all used Christmas sermon of, on, of 634 to illustrate this point, Sophronius would have certainly mentioned the religion of Indian fathers as Islam if he had been aware that the term referred to them as, at this time. He did not mention Muhammad at all, and as Kegi points out, in his view, the Arabs were simply terrible, godless in fathers without any religious impulse. Yet, some modern critics are reading the traditional account back into the words of sovereign use and other writers in order to promote a view that Islam was present from the, from the beginning of the conquest. For example, in the quote above by Kegi, he added the word in Pharex to Sophronius description to Sophronius description of the of the godless Saracen of the godless Saracens. This is because Kaigi, like other modern critics, apparently believes that many of the inferring tribesmen had only recently converted from paganism to Islam and therefore were imperfect followers of Muhammad. However, Nefu argues that if the Arabs of whom Sophronius complained were still pagan and Muhammad yet unknown, the fact that Sophronius mentioned neither the, the prophet nor the religion chooses to require explanation. In other words, we need to we need to be aware that when the document mentions Muhammad or Islam in or the Quran, or the original words may have been something like Saracen, Saracen prophets, Saracen prophet religion of the Israelites or simply writings of scriptures. A good example of this substitution may be found in the Chronicle of John of Nikiu, written in Egypt around 690. John refers many times to the Muslims and even mentions the, the, the detestable doctrine of the beast that is Muhammad. However, since the earliest text that we have in, in that we have is a 6003 Ethiopic translation from an early Arabic translation from the original Greek and Coptic. There is no way verily that the original word was Muslim instead of Saracen or Ismailite, which were also used in the Chronicle. It would also have been easy to insert the word Muhammad in reference to the doctrine of the peace. Neil argues that the John, that the John of Nikio text suffer tampering or and distortion since the since the term Muslim does not occur as well in Christian texts until AD 6, 775. Hyland also says that the term was probably Saracen or Arab in the original Coptic. Moreover, he suspects that the use of the use of Muhammad in his respect to the beast is also better close. If these early non-Muslim texts are so problematic, what can we ascertain from them? One thing we can pick up from a number of the early documents is that the Arab exposed, exposed a form of a, a form of transitional monotheistic religion similar to the forms of Judaistic and Christianity found in that area. For example, the homily of charged saints of Babylon written sometime in in the 640s, referred to the Saracens as religious yet barbaric. They would boast about the first and prayer, but were also regarded as, uh, as oppressors who massacred and lead into captivity the, son of, the sons of men. The religious activities 
were present, apparently, but not a very impressive fracasius. From the discussion between the Patriot John of Cedre and an Arab governor referred to as the Emir, which took place around 644, we can determine that through the Emir was religious, following a basic monotheism with Jewish Christian associations, he was not a Muslim and he did not mention Muhammad, Islam, nor the Quran. A number of non-Muslim writers in the 640s and 660s, such as Sebios, the Bishop of Baghdad, Tunis, the Karanikal of Kuzistan, provided outside sources regarding many of the battles between the Byzantines and the Arabs. The Karanikal of Kuzistan even records another possible reference to the leadership of Muhammad. In the last decades of the 7th century, men like John Bark Pan Kaye, WR 687, offer a more positive account of the Arab rule. John writes, for example, that in time of Muawiyah justice and peace flourish, as well as freedom for the Christians to worship, he then presents Muhammad as a guide, a teacher, and a legislator. For those who follow him as the prophet, this will fit in, in well with what we know of the of the rise of Abdul Malik during this time and his proclamation of Muhammad as the prophet in the year 691. In the time of Abdul Malik, however, Christians began to turn their attention from recording these events of the conquest to engage in theological and apologetic responses to the challenges of the Arabs. Sidney Griffith even states that it may have been Abdul Malik campaign to launch the new hegemony of Islam. The precipitated the precipitated the defensive apologetic and the taking the, char the character the first of the eighth century and led John and led up to John of Damascus and his treatise on the heresy of Ismailites as early as seven hundred Anastasios of Sinai referred to vast notions of the Arabs in regard to developing theological ideas. He seems to be aware of Quranic terms and had conversations with Arab Abu Dhabi, but he makes no explicit reference to Muhammad, the Quran, not the Quran or to Islam. In his book, Holy Ghost, he says that Christians were engaged in religious controversy with religious Arabs in his day, especially with regard to the Arab condemnation of anyone who says to God, uh, that God could have kindly be caught in the sun. There were topics that John of Damascus dealt with several decades later. In fact, like John, Anastasius believed that the Arab religion was a heresy. Another writer from around the turn of the century, a Syrian Orthodox bishop named Jacob of Edisa, D. 700-708 was aware of Arab religious beliefs that were monotheistic but neither Christian nor Jewish. The Arabs, according to Jacob, acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah unlike the Jews, but they did not accept Jesus as the Son of God. He also he also recognized that they called Jesus the Word of God as well as admitted that Jesus was the Spirit of God through without seeming to realize the significance of the laws. The material was, was also familiar to John of Damascus and used in his critique of Islam written several decades later. It is, a signific it is significant, however, that although Jacob of Vidisha seemed to be aware of these Quranic ideas and Islamic teachings during the time of Abdul Malik reign, he, didn't, he did not mention the Quran or the religion of Islam. Finally, there is a purported letter from Leo III to Umar II, 717-20, which details the information about Islam and maybe an earlier work than that of John of Damascus, but the authenticity of the letter is disputed and still unresolved. The earliest form we have is an Armenian translation from the late 8th century and, his, and this differs greatly from a letter from a later Latin version. The original version being presumably in Greek, such 
the 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 document no earlier than mid second century A.H. or some of some 30 years after John of Damascus wrote the heresy books. Leo, who is reported to have to have known both Greek and Arabic, may still be able to give us a theological snapshot of the mid 8th century. Curiously, Leo only knows the Quran by the name of Bukhan uh, and refers to it as a book of God that he believes was really written by Umar, Ali and Salman the Persian, presumably in the earlier decades, earlier decades. You admit that we say that it, the gospel, was written by God, as you pretend for your, for your Fukan, although we know that it was Umar, i.e. the second caliph, Abu Turab, i.e. Ali, and, the, and Salman the Persian who composed that. However, he is aware of he he is aware of some of its main teachings and seems to fo to focus the material found in Surah 2:5, which, interestingly enough, are the same ones that John of Damascus was familiar with. These surahs are also concerned with legal issues waging the facing the young empire. This makes more sense when we release that Leo never refers to Muhammad as a prophet, but rather relegates rele rele him to the position of a legislator or head of the Saracen religion. Thus, Leo's perception of Islam and of, his, and of its leader in the middle of the 8th century seems to be focused on the political rim rather than the spiritual one. John of Damascus, on the other hand, in his assessment of these same surahs, all and around the same time, emphasized the spiritual implication of the of the civil civil procedures, such as when he questioned the strong reliance on witness for any property dealings, yet held the prophet to a different standard. On the on the one hand, you take wives and possess property and then kiss and everything else. Two witnesses, two witnesses. Yet, on the other hand, you accept your faith and your scripture unwitnessed. From the one who had, who has handed down the scripture to you, has no verification for any source, nor is there, nor is there any prior witness to him known. Conclusion: Based on the best. Based on the best historical information at hand, did John of Damascus adequately portray Muhammad, the Quran, and the early Islamic theological disputes? When we consider that the earliest biography of Muhammad written by Muslims was in the late 8th century or even early 9th century, and the earliest that, that and er, and the earliest that the Muslims even mentioned the name Muhammad is around AD 690. That, then, what we have from the Muslim side are nine century writers relating what they believe happened in the 7th century. On the other hand, the Muslim written descriptions of Muhammad and the early and, and the early conquest by the Arabs for fight a valuable source for understanding the story of Muhammad's time. They also corroborate the, the writings of the of other of other contemporary writers, such as John of Damascus, who added theological insights into the historical ones. According to these documents, the invading Arabs exposed from uh, exposed a form of a transitional monotheistic religion, sim monotheistic religion similar to the form of Judaism and Christianity found, the, uh, found in the area. Some of these non-Muslim writers mention Muhammad as a prophet, guide, teacher, legislator, and even king decades before any Muslims record his name. Even though the earliest extant copies of some of these documents are several centuries later, allowing the name of Muhammad to have been redacted back into the copies, these documents at least attest to the fact that there was a religious Arab leader in the early part of the 17th century who preached a form of monotheism and motivated his fellow countrymen to migrate north. In the early part of the 8th century, John of Damascus also seemed to accept historical of Muhammad but referred to him as a past prophet. 
John also viewed the coercive religion that Muhammad started uh, as a heresy of Christianity. The other non-Muslim forces from the 7th and 8th centuries seem to be to bear witness to the same things. In addition, when we evaluate the evidence of what Nebo calls the development of an intermediate monotheism, many of the conclusions dovetail with John's observations. This view from the non-Muslim sources provides only a portion of the picture. However, when it is put together with the forensic evidence represented in archaeological, numismatic, and epigraphic search provided by the neo-revisionists, a more detailed snapshot of John's context is revealed. We have looked at the non-Muslim sources. Now we need to turn to what the forensic evidence represented in archaeological, numismatic, and epigraphic research reveals about, about just context.